Welcome to another edition of Grok Talk brought to you by GraniteRock.com, where we are dominating the political bandwidth in New Hampshire. Look for Granite Rock, that's G-R-A-N-I-T-E-G-R-O-K, on MeWe, Locals.com, Gab, Gab TV, and MeWe. You can also follow the Grok on my Minds, Codius, or Twitter feeds. Just look for NH Steve or the real NH Steve. I would like to remind our New Hampshire listeners, if you'd like to register to run for elective office, that begins tomorrow, June 1st, ends on June 10th. You can visit the New Hampshire Secretary of State's office online for more information at www.sos.nh.gov. That's sos.nh.gov. So, big issues du jour continue to be inflation, rising gas prices, a supersized federal debt, the World Economic Forum just met, the UN Global Reset is uh, still on pace with the World Health Organization, and, of course, school shootings and the left's authoritarian tick with regard to gun control. We're also waiting on Dobbs versus Jackson, which is a decision that could redefine viability in the womb and basically overturn in scare quotes, scare quotes, scare quotes, scare quotes, Roe v. Wade. Locally, Governor Groomer, that's Chris Sununu, continues to aggravate Republicans in the base by opposing parental rights and free speech. So we could touch on that, or as is usually the case, whatever crosses our minds and wherever that takes us. So. Joining me on this week's journey, we have Mike Rogers and our special guest this week, Hal Shirtliff. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. So, Hal, I'm going to start with you. Hal's a U.S. Army veteran. He's the co-founder and the director of Camp Constitution. And he is now part of a fraternity of citizens who have taken a case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and won. So, first of all, congratulations there. That's a, that's a thing. Um, for people who haven't been following, why don't you just start briefly by telling us how it started? Well, at the time, I was living in Boston, where I was born and raised, and just recently moved up here for, uh, December of 20, uh, up in Alton, New Hampshire. But I was at a, uh, a prayer meeting that was uh, started by an inner city pastor, Bruce Wall, Reverend Bruce Wall, at the mayor's office. That would have been June of 17. And I was very encouraged by what I saw. I saw blacks, whites, Asians, and uh, Asians, and what else, uh, Latinos. Uh, and I said, this is the body of Christ. And uh, we prayed for our leaders. We prayed for safety. We prayed for harmony, all the stuff that Christians are supposed to pray for, even praying for leaders we don't particularly like or in some cases, completely detest. Uh, Walsh was nowhere to be found. But afterwards, I thought that uh, the Christian community should step up in Boston. It's been kind of silent on many issues. And I thought what a great way to commemorate uh, Constitution Day is to raise the Christian flag on Boston City Hall Plaza, where they have what I refer to as a public access flagpole. Uh, they have three flagpoles, and the third flagpole has the city's flag. And for the last 12 years... The city has allowed a program where civic organizations can have a ceremony and raise a flag. And so uh, and back, it was back in, I think, 2013, we raised the Gadsden flag. Of course, uh, I would say most of your listeners know that's the rattlesnake with the don't tread on me. And uh, our late friend Garrett Lear, the Patriot pastor of New Hampshire, was there to raise the flag. No, many, people don't say too much when someone's six foot seven we're carrying around a musket in downtown Boston. They sort of, you know, respect, <laughs> respect us. So we, we had a good ceremony. We videotaped it. And so I didn't expect any difficulty. And uh, the lady I dealt with was very helpful. She was the uh, mayor of Menino's um, daughter-in-law. And I just told her what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a ceremony during the weekday before lunch or after lunch. And we were going to have uh, several speakers, uh, a historian talking about Boston's rich Christian history. Another one of our instructors, his name was Richard Howell. You, so you probably met him over the years. Um, another man was Reverend Stevie Kraft. He's our camp chaplain, happens to be black. And he was going to talk about the need for racial harmony, which, of course, is more so now than ever. And uh, then a, a third speaker would have been uh, William, Pastor William Levy, formerly of the Sudan, now a, a, a resident, uh, a citizen of the United States. And I was going to speak about the Constitution. And we would have raised the Christian flag, which is a non-denominational flag. It's not as old as people think. It goes back to the late 1890s. 
and it was uh, Coney Island is where it was uh, created. So I tell people that several things come out of there that are good. The Nathan's famous hot dog, the uh, <laughs> the cyclone there, and uh, and the Christian flag. And uh, usually when you put it for a permit, you get it within a short time. And the purpose of the permit is to just to make sure there isn't another group using it at that time frame. And uh, it dragged on for it was a series of phone calls, and finally I got an answer. No, it was September of seventeen, and I asked for a official response, either in a letter or an email. And I got an email from the man who became the defendant in the case, a uh, Mr. Rooney, who was in charge of the facility at City Hall. And he said, separation of church and state. When I got that email, I knew we had a case. When I saw that term, I said, yes, okay, we know that this is a bogus uh, issue. And ironically, the city has a seal, which I guess all cities do, and also on its flag is the seal contains a Bible verse from the Old Testament, uh, First Kings. May God favor us as he favored our forefathers, which I would say is a more religious expression than the simple construct of the Christian flag, which just is a, a white field, a blue cant in the left top corner, and then the red, what we refer to as the Latin cross. That's pretty a simple construct. And uh, so I sent out a news release to the local media and some local friends. Uh, and not one response from the local media at that point, but a friend of mine, Lynn Roberts of the uh, Second Amendment Sisters, told me to get a hold of Liberty Council. I did that very night. And the next day I got a call from one of their attorneys, Richard Mass, and he said, uh, we want to take your case. And within a short time, they sent out a demand letter. And the demand letter said, if we can't raise the flag, we're going to file a lawsuit violation of the First Amendment, uh, as the letter said, a separation of church and state. So the demand letter went out. We went unanswered. Now, they did tell us that uh, we could have we could fly a secular flag if we wanted to, or we could bring all the flags we wanted to, but we couldn't raise them. So we could have the Christian flags. We could carry them. And I says, well, it's not much of a flag raising ceremony if you can't actually raise a flag. And uh, so I made, it got in some media, it made the front page of the Boston Herald and uh, some, some, uh, online, uh, uh, some online entities, World Net Daily and some others. But the following July is when the lawsuit was actually filed, and that made a lot of news. And then we lost at the first, uh, the first, uh, first court, for, I think it's called the first uh, district court. Then we lost the appeal at the federal first district court of appeals. And then there was another suit filed with much more information. Our attorneys, they did an incredible job. They, um, they just found out that there were like 280 other times that there was the flag raising ceremonies. Not 280 flags, but some organizations raise their flag every year, uh, including the Communist Chinese, the so-called uh, Chinese Progressive Association of Boston. In fact, that's when the first time I realized there was a flag raising ceremony. I was leaving uh, the Suffolk Superior Court after being dismissed for jury duty. Uh, and um, I saw the fl communist flag being raised. I was kind of surprised. I said, "What? What on earth is happening?" You know, it, maybe you remember Khrushchev said that we don't have. To, he said uh, something to the effect that talking to an American. I think when I was talking to Nixon, he said, uh, "We don't. We don't. We're going to be here in another couple of generations." He said, "Your grandchildren will raise the flag of socialism." Well, they're doing it now, unfortunately. So, um, anyway. Uh, we we lost again at the first district court and the court of appeals three zero and that was and so in June of last year we filed up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court only hears about one percent of the eight hundred or so cases it gets and on September thirtieth they of last year they said we will take this case so it takes four justices to agree to take a case that doesn't mean they're going to rule in your favor but they agree to hear it which in itself is sort of a, a sort of a miracle. And uh, it was a few days after that, the city of Boston uh, said, we want to settle. And I thought, well, I don't want to settle. I said, it's really more than just uh, uh, raising the flag. They were going to let us raise the flag and pay uh, Liberty Council's legal fees at that point, which were probably about a half a million dollars at that, at that time. These lawyers don't work for, uh, they work pro bono, but when they do bill, they bill. And but we thought they would allow us to do it once and then never again. Uh, and I don't think there would have been a precedent. And I'm not even sure if the lower court's decision would have stood. So Shirtliff v. Boston would have been an, you know, uh, uh, they would have the city's decision would have stood that the city can determine what's said on their property. And the flag is considered speech. So, um, 
And we had our oral argument January 18th. We had a wonderful prayer vigil the night before and a rally the morning of. We had a lot of folks show up. And there was even a, a, a congresswoman, Victory, Vic, um, Vicki Herzl from Missouri, that asked to be there. She said, I've been following this case. And we had people from Focus on the Family, the Frederick Douglass Foundation, and many other groups there on our behalf. So it was really encouraging to see that. People I mean, T traveling long distances to be there. Well, during the oral argument, we weren't allowed to be in the courtroom. Um, just the attorneys, the city attorney. And oh, by the way, we had 18 or 19 amicus briefs on our behalf. And it's interesting, the ACLU was one of the organizations that said in their amicus brief, to paraphrase, while they disagree with almost everything we stand for, which is what I hope they would do, <laughs> they have a right to fly the flag. And also the Justice Department under the Biden administration, they also sent an amicus brief. And then we had Notre Dame Law School, we had the American Legion, we had Americans Defending Freedom, which is similar, American Freedom Alliance, I think, which is similar to Liberty Council and several other groups and 12 attorney generals, state attorney generals. And against us were nine um, entities, including, I think, nine attorney generals, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut, uh, and, and D.C., which is not a state, but uh, their attorney general, and uh, uh, the National Council of Churches, and folks who know anything about that, they've been a far-left entity from its, some of their inception. And uh, while we were listening to the oral argument, uh, the attorneys were all smiling, uh, and they said, uh, you know, even the liberal justices are coming out and be kind of scolding the city's attorney. And so people, even left-wing media pundits, were predicting a possible 9-0 uh, in our favor. And sure enough, uh, May 2nd, they made the decision 9-0. And it was interesting, too, because uh, we, I got more media coverage. Uh, Newsmax, uh, Fox and Friends uh, interviewed me. But as I was waiting to get on the Rob Schmidt show, that's when the Roe v. Wade uh, leak kind of broke, you know. So... Uh, that took a little bit of, I think, momentum away from us, but that's fine. We, we, you know, it's I say it's in God's hands, and but I think this this um, case isn't just about one little flagpole in one city. I think uh, we hear from people around the country that they've been motivated by this, and it's issues like kids bringing candy canes to schools. And the candy cane, uh, there's a principle somewhere, I forget where it was, said, well, that's shaped like a J for Jesus, and there's a Christian allegory that goes to the candy cane. So you can't bring candy canes. You can't say, God bless you if you sneeze. And some of this crazy uh, stuff that's going on, it's just really, people have, people have completely misinterpreted that First Amendment. And what's interesting is that the First Amendment has no mention of separation of church and state, as you both know, and I would say most of your listeners know, it says that Congress will not establish no denied a free exercise of religion. At the time the First Amendment was passed in 1791, I should say ratified, um, there were about four or five, at least four or five states that had state churches. Not that I'm in favor of a state church, but that First Amendment had actually no bearing on the, the state churches of, I think, Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts. I think Virginia may have had a state church at that time. Thankfully, the states themselves, uh, little by little, uh, ended up doing away with that provision uh, of having a state church, some of, some of the negative things they got from, from Europe, and they, they repealed that. So, um, and I, I heard for feedback in Nashua, New Hampshire, they have a flagpole that's similar to what, what they have in Boston, and this, this lady, Beth Scour, she uh, raised the defend female sports flag back in October of 2020. She, they said she could do it for a week. And the mayor there got really upset and probably got some complaints from some people whose feelings were hurt. And they took it down within a day. And she hired an attorney. The attorney wrote a letter. And the city uh, mayor, city's mayor said, oh, well, uh, Shirtliff v. Boston, they have the right to refuse that flag. And May 3rd, her attorney wrote a letter uh, and said, Shirtliff v. Boston, 9-0, you got to raise that flag. So right now, the city has not allowed her to do that, and she's been in touch with Liberty Council. And in Randolph, Vermont, there was a gentleman who's running for state senate. He'd been trying to get the Black Lives Matter flag taken down from the local high school. Uh, he said, this is illegally flown. This is not a you know flag that should be flown. It's a, making a political statement. He tried to have a counter. He tried to have a freedom and unity and American flag, and they rejected him. 
So he uh, got a hold of the school and he mentioned our case. And the next day they quietly took the Black Lives Matter flag down. And the town of um, Delaware, Ohio, or city actually, which is about 45 miles north of, um, of uh, Columbus, uh, there was um, they were going to fly or put this these flags on these lampposts like 72 uh, rainbow flags and a pro-family group said we want to have uh, pro-family flags flying uh, after you take these down we want to have our flags up so the city said no flags whatsoever just u.s flag state flag city flag and the pow flag and that's it that's where we're out of the flag raising business which is probably the best way to go and I think there's a few other towns uh, have changed their policies. Reading, Massachusetts had changed their policy, no flags flying. And there's probably others around the country because they would rather not fly any flag than fly a flag that expresses a message of liberty and freedom and Christianity. So so be, that's, that's, I think, what's going to be happening. <laughs> well, as always, you really shouldn't ever ask permission. You should just do because that's what freedom of speech is. Now, well, Steve, correct, we, see, but... we see you moving. Are you with us now? Oh, Steve is still having uh, communication problems. Keep going, Hal. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, anyway, we are uh, we're we're very we were excited about the decision uh, because I said uh, being an entity called Camp Constitution, I said we have to we have we had to have fought this case one way or the other. Uh, in fact, it was another organization that stepped up, but we had already signed a contract, Liberty, and we're very happy that uh, Liberty did um, help us out. And uh, in fact, one of our one of their attorneys, Jonathan Alexander, will be an instructor at our camp this year, which is coming up next month, actually, right here in right here in beautiful New Hampshire, Plainfield, New Hampshire, July seventeenth to the twenty second. Very nice. I'll see if I can reserve some time. Do you have Wi-Fi that works at that camp this time? Oh, yes, we do. And it's, uh, yeah, we do. Uh, I think it's, uh, you were at the camp in west of Massachusetts there when uh, Lord I, Moncton. I, I, I was, and, and Lord yeah. Moncton was great, but I couldn't stream a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, well, what happens is if you get, uh, you know, get 100 people all using the internet, you know, it kind of puts a damper on things. But I think it's a little better there. at, um, at It's the Singing Hills Christian Camp. Uh, that we use in Plainfield. It's a really good facility. I'll have to look it up and reserve a spot and we'll, book a we'll couple have of to days. Schedule up. Uh, we're going to have some, inter you know, we'll, we always have great instructors every year, and we have some that return every year, but teach different classes, so it's not the same thing every year. But Professor Willie Soon, he is oh, one yeah. of the, uh, yeah, he's, he, he's the one that was able to get Lord Moncton here. And uh, he's uh, one of the, I'd say not just one of the local, but one of the world's top climate realists. He's the one that exposed the so-called hockey stick graph. You remember where, oh. uh, you know, that uh, climate change was about to destroy the planet and all this carbon in the atmosphere with you know, such a short time. And he, he easily refuted that. And, and, and he was just a quiet scientist doing his research. And he said he had to do it. He wasn't trying to do it to get attention. But as a scientist, he said science is science, and he was tired of this so-called phony pseudo-political science, and that's what um, when motivated uh, and, him. And and he's a hero. And you know, and I've only got uh, only got one answer to these things. How did the plants do at four thousand parts per million? Eh? What's that now? Yes. I, oh, how how, did, how well, did the plants grow, grow at four thousand parts per million? Yeah, exactly. Well, I hear carbon is the poor man's fertilizer. That's exactly. Uh, so Willie go in fact Willie's class he's gonna be doing two classes, but it's it's dealing with how science has been politicized. You know, the history of the politicization of science. Oh the, I'm sorry, the weaponization of science. And um then we have uh Alex Newman who uh does a show on Frank Speech. He uh, he's um he's an author, he writes for Walt Net Daily, The New American and others. He he's gonna be giving a class on the Great Reset. And then another one on defending your um, worldview. And that's really important for young people. You know, we can tell them, we can teach them all, they talk about all these things. We could fill their heads full of facts, but if they can't defend what they believe in, they'll, uh, you know, easily enough, um, you know, jump onto the other side where the left will mo no doubt eagerly embrace them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Are you back with us, Steve? I, I am. I'm not exactly sure what it did to my recordings. I may have a mess on my hands as far as trying well, to paste all this together. Uh, but well, you guys should be fine. Hell kept, kept on going. I asked just a couple of questions. 
Now, you know, Howell talked about the politicization of science, which plays into the piece that was on American Thinker yesterday. It's called the mafia tactic that brought down CNN. But what it's about is much more interesting than that. It's about how the government and non-governmental organizations have essentially marched through the deep the state. The deep state has marched through all these libertarian organizations and perverted them. And the fall of CNN was just an example of how it's done. They call it a mafia bust out where you make the organization indebted to you and then you force it to finance things that it shouldn't be doing and can't afford. And then finally it goes goes bust because there's no credibility left. Well, we know that CNN is bust because it has no credibility left. Look at CNN Plus, or was it CNN Minus? But he mentions... That lasted a whole 30 days, isn't it? Yeah. He mentions how CNN went down, National Review, of course, we know the, anti, the anti-Trump the anti band there at National Review, the ACLU that doesn't hold up liberties, at least not very much, the Centers for Disease Control that doesn't prevent disease, the World Health Organization that's bad for your health, and so on and so forth. And you know, American Medical Association ceases to up- uphold medical standards, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we know that AFL-CIO does not work effectively for the workers anymore. We have a friend in eastern uh, New Hampshire near the coast who is working to de-democrat the unions. He's actually a um, a first responder. I wish him the best of luck. It's not going to be easy, but that's his goal, to de-democrat the unions. But anyway, the the point is that the the left and the deep state has marched through all these otherwise fine organizations and reduce them to rubble and it's uh, it's a pretty convincing story it's true though and i just read a piece by um tom woods he was talking about how the libertarian party in america had been completely useless for years and and been undermined by people who didn't want to do anything necessary and they recently had an election and they invested a lot of effort in in this project and they managed to basically replace all these slugs with actual libertarians who are actually going to do libertarian things. And uh, it's kind of exciting when somebody takes an organization back and uh, it takes it away from cowards, people. I mean, like when Trump got elected, I mean, he he invigorated a lot of people. He invigorated people who hadn't registered to vote in years. Some had never voted. Uh, organizations started to, to swarm with this new interest. A lot of independents, some blue collar Dems, and they were very excited. And, and this was like, everybody's like, hey, we're taking it back. We're taking it back. And of course, what they underestimated was that the uh, inside the Beltway DC swamp is so deep that it is virtually impossible to clean it out unless you walk in there with a president and a Congress that is willing to gut the federal government. And that is a big project, but it is still one that needs to happen. And it's still one that we should sort of support because we're never gonna get these institutions back if we don't fight, take them back. There's one organization uh, that you, it's the NRA. Back in the 90s, they were actually supporting various gun control measures. The one that was passed under Daddy Bush with the the five-day waiting period. And uh, it was amazing how they compromised. But I think they they had various elections, and they were able to get it back into the hands of people who really believed that the Second Amendment uh, was sort of an absolute thing. It's not something you can compromise with. In fact, when I I talk about gun control... um, or the Second Second Amendment really didn't give us that right. We had that right long before there was a Second Amendment, and most people get caught up in the the wording of the Second Amendment. But we have a we have a right, whether you believe in God or not, to uh, to defend ourselves. And that simply said that the Congress can't mess with that. And they use this term militia. Oh, it has something to do with a militia, which is a National Guard. But you know, militia is um, that that has nothing to do with the right that keep and bear arms that we've always had from. I don't think the folks at Lexington and Concord said, oh, my goodness, we're not allowed to have these muskets. We don't have a Second Amendment yet. You know? <laughs> I had I had this conversation with a friend of mine or a couple of friends of mine from high school. We all live in different parts of the country now, but every now and then we chat on Facebook or somewhere. And um, 
this this subject came up and I said, well, okay, so explain it to me. Uh, if you were just born in the middle of nowhere and you worked to gather resources to stay alive, that's essentially your property, right? They're like, yeah. And I said, do you have a right to that property? And they're like, well, assuming you didn't steal it from somebody else, sure. I said, well, what if people want to steal it from you? Do you have a right to defend that property or to defend yourself in the pursuit of defending that property? And they kind of sort of figured out where I was going and they sort of, oh yeah, I guess. All right. So what does that mean? How much right to defense of your life and your property do you have? And they didn't really want to go as far as it should naturally go, which is as far as it needs to go. I mean, your right to defend your life is as far as you must go to defend it. And that means in a modern world that you have to be able to compete with criminals and your government because they're the ones who are really doing most of the stealing. One of the things that I encourage your, reader, um, your readers, your listeners to look into is their state constitutions. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's the oldest state, con it's the oldest constitution in the world that's st uh, still in use, although most people don't look at it very often, uh, especially those who run for office, especially Republicans who run for office because I'm always offering them to. Uh, and the same thing with the New Hampshire constitution. Uh, the right to keep and bear arms in these documents is much strongly, much strongly worded. Str uh, uh, strongly worded. I got it right. Okay, thank you. Um, for example, I think is it New Hampshire? You, ha you have the right, the right to uh, keep um, the right to over overturn your government. Right. That's that's uh, right. That's yeah, ten A. I think it is. Yeah. Right to revolution. Yeah. Yes. Not that we necessarily want one. Uh, in Massachusetts, it says you have the right to defend your property. Now, how do you defend your property? Ba uh, you know, calling nine one one and hiding under the under the table or running out the back door, or do you defend it with uh, a, a weapon tree? That's true, and, and that that reminds me of another thing. I had an incident with one of my kids where somebody was bullying him, and he said, "Leave me alone, or I'm going to f and kill you." And of course, it's a public school, so they have to assume he really means that, even though everybody knows he's just talking smack. And I ended up having a conversation with a uh, a local police officer in town. We went down and had a little chat about it, and uh, he said, "Do you have any weapons in the house?" And I said pencil's a weapon and he just gives That's me right. this look and i'm like none of your business what weapons i have in my house because everything's a weapon right that's right he, he kind of reluctantly agreed with me but you know he meant firearms and i said no because at the time i didn't have any in the house so now i have a few. You're all in your trunk, right? <laughs> yeah, right? All right. Well, that's a good topic because, you know, after these shootings, we're learning all sorts of things about the failures of government and so-called police protection and all these other things. And uh, the Democrats are calling for um, end of the Second Amendment. You know, Michael Moore wants to make it go away as if that would change the natural rights. And if we have other people yeah, like this is the same Michael Moore, though, that has uh, when Karl Marx's anniversary of his birthday came up a few years ago was what his 200th end of whatever it was. Not to oh, anyway, he was just gushing. He just loved Karl Marx. And uh, so that's where he's coming from. This, uh, oh, I know. I know his his only uh, glint of being red pilled was when he did Planet of the Humans and discovered that none of the solutions the left had come up with would work or be better. And that was pretty much it for him. But he's, you know, he's still way over there. Um, you know, we have some Republicans who are already scurrying for cover because they don't want to talk about it. And, um, you know, they're, they're saying we want red flag laws. Maine has yellow flag laws. Um, Ian, who writes for us, suggested purple flag laws, which is an interesting thing if you haven't read it. Um, he has an older post and he has another one coming up. But the basic premise is, is this. If you have somebody who you think is unstable or dangerous and shouldn't have firearms, um, why don't you call the police and they can come and they can pick up the individual, not the weapons, because the individual has habeas corpus rights and the weapons do not. And then... They can go have a conversation, and if it turns out that there was absolutely no reason for this, and this was in spite or just to get even, the person who made the call would go to jail. That's a great deterrent for that. I mean, if somebody really is at high risk, I mean, you want to have a conversation with that person, right? Whether it's you or me or a family member or somebody else, you know, it's with anything else like that. If somebody's really off the deep end, I mean, they're having a really hard time. They're just... just 
behaving erratically, of course you want to talk to them. You don't want to take their property. You want to take them and sit them down and say, listen, how's it going? Do you need some help? What can we do for you? You know, you don't just go steal their stuff. And, but that's what they want because, and Hal knows why, and so does Mike, they just want to take the guns. They really don't care. And, and, and the point is then they'll come for the people and the people will say, hell no, at least some of them will. And then there'll be gunfights and then they say, see, we told you so. And they'll send out the uh, full force of the armed police and uh, military to come and get them. All those bearcats that Obama helped them all buy. I am a disciple of the late Sam Blumenfeld. Uh, Sam was a pioneer in the homeschool movement. He was one of the earliest people to acknowledge that there was a deliberately dumbing down of the American people. He went far beyond Rudolf Fleisch, who wrote a book in 56, Why Johnny Can't Read. He got, uh, he, he's told me in 1989 that I should never allow my children, at that time I was the father of one, now the father of five, never allowed them to set foot in a government school and they never did he did a lot of writings and by the way we've archived his works on our website the sam blumenfeld archive um he did a lot with dyslexia he did a lot with the drugging down of our children and the violence that has uh, that some of these young boys taking these psychotropic drugs engage and most of this stuff didn't happen in these schools up until um, i think the early 90s when some of the early shooting incidents and 92 percent of these school shootings the perpetrator is uh, on one of some of these psychotropic drugs and it's almost a taboo subject you get because the big farmers behind it uh, you discuss this and you'll, you know, pull the plug. Oh, no, it's about guns. It's about this, about that. It's about racism, about white supremacy. And uh, so that's, I think, the big issue here. And I said the best solution, one of the best solutions is to do away with the compulsory education laws. And I'm sure all of you libertarians are there say, right on. That's something hard because we've had these things since the 1850s. And most people say, well, wasn't it always that way? And isn't it a good thing? Because if we don't have that, boy, the kids wouldn't be educated. Well, the government schools, I think, are, are dangerous. And um, in fact, Sam's last book before he passed in 15, that he co-authored with Alex Newman, he said there were four things that schools, that your child's at risk. He said, one is morally, two ac academically, spiritually, and physically. And he made a case. He makes a case for all of them. In fact, crimes as the educators, uh, I think they listed 10 different things. And we're not talking about the local school teacher who can only teach what they in turn have been taught. You know, they teach that we're democracy and they're taught that our America has a, a bad history or uh, that the global warming is going to kill us, kill off the planet in eight years unless we have the whole country's turned into use enough but wind turbines and uh, electric cars. That They don't know any better, but the people behind them do. And uh, he, John, uh, he did a lot of research into John Dewey. And John Dewey, the so-called father of progressive education in 1898, uh, he said, uh, and we reprinted this, the education fetish, fetish, where he said that we don't need a literate society. And uh, he said, we will use the classroom as a pastor uses the pulpit to promote our humanist prom uh, agenda. And that's a big problem. And so these young people come into schools, they uh, are taught that we live in a purposeless and a different universe, that they not, they're not taught to read properly, so they have dyslexia, and the solution isn't teaching, teach them uh, phonics, intensive phonics, the solution is to drug them down. They go into the school, there's a big sign that says drug-free zone, except the drugs that you get administered <laughs> by the, uh, by the, the, the school. Oh, that's excellent, Hal. That's excellent. You know, yeah. I just had a published post, a post just published at six, and it's titled Dems Hope School Shootings End the Second Amendment, Amendment, but what if they end public schools? And in it, I posit pretty much something very similar to the idea that because, you know, the government has made this promise that they can educate your children, which clearly they can't. And it's become more apparent that it's an indoctrination center recently than probably at any point in history. And they can't even protect them. So why would a parent who had a choice between sending their child to a public school or coming up with an alternative not go with an alternative? So I think, you know, every time one of these events happens, the, the left always goes with the same template. And we're always trying to come up with 
different ways to have the conversation, you know, to say different things about it. Now, in New Hampshire, of course, you can, your money follows the child now. So it's a lot easier for a parent to say to the town, listen, I'm going to tuition my kid at this school over here. And the town just says, all right, here's your part of your taxes that you get in exchange for that. And you pay the rest of the tuition and good luck or whatever, you know. And uh, if more states were like that, uh, this would be a huge problem for them because really there's nothing flattering about these school shootings for the way the government or the Democrats or the unions have, have advanced their agenda. They, they, don't, they make them soft targets deliberately. They fight to make them soft targets. And then crazy people shoot up kids. Well, gun-free zones don't work. The, uh, yeah, you have. The gun-free zones don't work. Uh, the supposedly trained school cops are afraid to go in and face the threat. Uh, there are no basic security procedures, like, for example, teachers leaving the, the doors open. And all of these things lead to um, yeah, essentially a more vulnerable situation than anything you could have imagined simply by either A, leaving well enough alone, or B, letting the school kids come to school with uh, their gun racks on the back of their pickup trucks for practice afterwards, or C, arming and training the teachers. Any of those things are going to be uh, preferable to uh, what we have now. And the cowards of Broward and now the, uh, the bums at Uvalde have proven that uh, renter cops for school don't work. Hal? Yes, uh, you mentioned all these different options. It's, in, it's sad that a, a public school has to be an armed camp, uh, that you have to bolt the doors shut because you don't know who's going to be coming in. Now, I'm 63. I went to a government school during the height of forced busing. We, had, we used to have FBI agents in the school, so I'm, <laughs> and we still had problems. Although I can't remember any guns being in the classroom. There was uh, violence. Um, you know, there was people hurt. Knives would come through. And you could get a gun in if you tried, but I just don't remember my experience any um, any time there was uh, guns were used. Um, but, you know, my cousin, uh, who was a little younger than I, he grew up in Drake at Massachusetts. He used to bring his pickup truck, as you said, with a gun rack in the back. And he was always getting into fights. He was a big, strong guy, and uh, people would challenge him. But the thought of shooting people was just not 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 present back then. You know, no, they, they were, were uh, trained with their guns properly, trained to respect right. them and not point them at people. That's right. There was a gun culture. The gun culture isn't so much in the in, in the cities. You know, we came up here. Uh, I, uh, my youngest daughter had a prom date, and the culture up here is that you take a picture with your daughter or the oldest brother with your AR or your shotgun. I said, oh, I like this. I like this tradition. This is pretty cool, you know. So the prom date is going to be on his his best behavior. Uh, but it's a lot different in the inner cities. And it's, it's the inner cities is where the guns are needed more than anywhere else. In fact, I know, I know this won't get on because it's an audio, but um, you see my T-shirt. It has, says, uh, protect the flock with a Glock. And uh, I know a lot of churches... On the back, it says the devil's coming to church, and it has a, a Jesus where he said to his uh, disciples, he said, sell your cloak and buy a sword. And that sword would have been what, it, what was illegal for Jews to own was a Roman sword, which would be the AR or AK of its day. And uh, I know churches where most of the men are armed, and there are protocols. What happens if somebody comes in? I got a chance to meet uh, the gentleman from South Africa, Charles Van Week. A wonderful guy and he was in a church and some African National Congress communists came in with automata with AKs and shot the place up he had a, a handgun I don't what forget what it was he fired a few rounds and then he was going to go in the he ran out the back to intercept them and just the firing of a few, a few rounds it was like three or four of them. they all ran and got back in their cars and, and scrammed he visited a few of them in jail, and he said, we were ordered to kill every single person in that church. There was a couple of hundred. They did kill a, a number of them, but not as many have, had they. And he wrote a book about it. And so had they known he was, if he was armed, they probably wouldn't have even come in. And uh, uh, so that's something that, unfortunately, that we're going to have to do uh, more so. 
and I think that's a. It's, and I know that people like Keith Hansen. I think you know Keith pretty well. He uh, his his organization trains people, and in fact, I just went to one of his training sessions um, last week. He invited me last Saturday, and then the shooting happened Monday, and it's basically how to identify. Uh, how to identify what to do uh, when you have one of these active shooters. And, you know, it's something that's out of our comfort zone. I mean, how many people, most of us will never experience that. Although I was I was working in the post office when we had a uh, live shooter. He was on an airplane, though, flying. He just thought he had murdered his wife and flew a little Piper Cup and fired some rounds in. So it wasn't the same as somebody being there right there. You know, we, we had not much you could do. We couldn't, we couldn't fire back, you know, unless you, uh, we just had to get out of the way. And thankfully there were no fatalities except for his poor wife. But um, there are things that can be done. And it's interesting too. He said, never play dead. He said, uh, because a number of these incidents is where the person plays dead, they get shot anyway. He said, get, the goal is to get out of there. But the, at, at these recent shooting, there was uh, uh, one of the students that what took blood from their their friend's body and, and somehow was able to save was save his I think it was a boy I'm not sure, but uh, they, the life was spared. So um, and a lot of these cops aren't trained properly. You know, it's not. He said usually on TV when, when you see a, a sea like this, they just stand and make a barrier and wait for the SWAT team to come in because they're trained to do to to take care of business. So I don't know all the details about the uh, the police standing down. I, if they were ordered, they had to have been ordered to stand down. I mean, I don't know what's coming out about that. So he, they're catching a lot of flack. And it was what, the uh, one of the fathers who was getting his hair cut? He grabbed his shotgun? Yep. He was a uh, Border Patrol agent getting his hair cut nearby with a barber. His wife, who was a teacher in the school, texted him, active shooter, I love you. He left the middle of his haircut grabbed the shotgun from the barber who owned the weapon and went and proceeded to enter the building and end the event. So those are the people that we need and want. And and, and if they don't run towards the gunfire, they're the wrong people for the job. Yeah, I think that, and you're right about the police policy. I mean, these cops are pretty much following what they're ordered to do, but it's not turning out well. I think we've seen that repeatedly. And, you know, they were stopping parents from going in there. And, uh, of course, as you mentioned earlier, the real answer is to harden these targets, to make people understand that there are armed and trained individuals who are concealed carrying in this facility. I just copied another sign from some school that said it had armed and trained staff and that anybody who came in to do violence would be met with extreme violence in return, basically. And that's the deterrent, just like it was in Africa, just like it is everywhere else around here. I mean, in New Hampshire, we have, we don't have, uh, we have a gun culture. I mean, we're a constitutional carry state. We also have HB 1178, which would invalidate any federal law or executive order that doesn't align with state law with regards to firearms. Passed the House and the Senate. It's been lingering for about two weeks now. The governor hasn't signed it. Apparently, they haven't even put it on his desk because if it was after five days, it would become law. The problem appears to be that we've had three active shooter events since that law left the legislature. So I imagine he's going to sit on it until there's a week when there's no shootings. But I'm, I'm so suspicious of Governor Sununu's motivations at this point. I'm beginning to wonder if he will sign it. Well, see, th what happens is that all this emotion, people get emotional, and uh, policy should not be driven by emotion. And that's what happens. And people are blaming somehow my AR is somehow responsible for what happened in Texas. Uh, if you belong to a pro Second Amendment group, you're somehow, you're the guilty one. No, this deranged 18 year older is guilty, and he's been t thankfully taken out, as he should have been taken out. Uh, and the guy in Buffalo, too, he was not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not those who believe it's not the manufacturers of weapons. Uh, but it's all about the narrative. We know they want to do away with the right to keep and bear arms. And that's uh, and here in New Hampshire. I think we have some of the lowest murder rates in the country. I think we're something like, what, 47, 46. Uh, and I'm talking about per capita, not necessarily, you know, obviously we have a relatively small population. And you look at all the states that have the, I think we have one of the largest per capita gun ownerships, uh, gun ownership in the country. You look at states like Maine, Vermont, Montana, 
North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, and uh, Idaho. These states have very high gun ownership, but for some strange reason have a very low murder rate. And uh, what... Are you coming in my home? Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a friend that used to say, you can break into my house easy enough. Getting out of my house without being carried out in a body bag, now that's going to be the challenge, you know? That's true. And New Hampshire, um, I think... You know, people understand that the we we do have really low crime. We we rank as one of the safest states in the nation year after year after year. Um, Vermont used to be safer than us, but the Democrats have had control of that state long enough now that Burlington's crime is getting out of hand. So we are now going to be safer than them probably every year. Maine is following Vermont down the same toilet, and that. You know, we're starting to run out of states where, I mean, they won't have constitutional carry for too much longer in either of those states. It's it's really up to us, I think, in New Hampshire to be that place, to be that beacon. To, to And, I mean, we will continue to have low crime. You know, the, the biggest crime-ridden city in our state is Manchester, Never and thought. that is run by yeah, right. Maggie Hassan. Uh, not Maggie Hassan. Um, Joyce Craig. Sorry, Joyce. I'm sure she is proudly saying, oh, boy, he called me Maggie. <laughs> I feel so wonderful. Well, it's interesting, too, uh, when the city of Boston declared Boston uh, racism as a health hazard. I'm not, not sure how that manifests itself, you know, of racist band-aids, right? You get a cough, is it racist? It's just so ridiculous. But it's all these Democrat-controlled cities. There hasn't been a Republican mayor in Boston since 19, early 1930s. So... Uh, uh, and it was interesting, too, at the time. I know we're getting off the track a little bit, but it's almost like when you have gun control, you have racist cities. But the town of Lexington, the Historical Society, had a big old Black Lives Matter banner in front of it. I had I had a little fun with them, and I... Uh, I, uh, I, I, a channel, I wrote, sent an email to all of the people, and uh, we did a little video about it, how ridiculous this is. And they stood their ground. They said, we're, you know, they kind of doubled down, and they said, well, we stand with Black Lives Matter, like thousands and thousands of organizations around the country. And I got back to them. I said, well, I said, I didn't realize that your historical society was systemically racist. I thought you folks do a good job by uh, including the great contributions of black patriots or, during the Revolutionary War. And I said, but come to think of it, Lexington is 99.9 .9 or 99.5 percent non-black, it is 20 percent Asian. So I could see that where this racism must be quite rampant in your ranks. Uh, and they never got back to me. They didn't want to deal with that, you know. Uh, so, but it is it is interesting where you see the crime, you see strict gun control at Chicago. I don't know how many people were murdered over this last weekend. But I would say more than 10, more than twenty, and there's a more, lot of more, more than two school shooting sprees, and that's not that's a right. nice but thing to say. They don't get any attention, and the people behind this, the people that run these cities, are part of the problem because they have prosecutors that won't prosecute, they have mayors that won't enforce uh, the certain laws, or they, they're anti-police, they defund the police, and they want to turn around and take away our Second Amendment, or I should say, our right to keep and bear arms. I can. I contend that we're, we, we, we are still winning the debate uh, because uh, look at all of the states states that have become con constitutional carry since the 1990s. I think we got 24 or 22, somewhere like that, states. And New Hampshire just recently became, what was it? I was at the hearings back in, what was it, 16? So we've, we've only been become a constitutional carry since 16 or 17. Uh, Maine, of course, uh, was right before us, and then Vermont was the first one. And a number of states have jumped on. I think uh, North Dakota, I think, came on board, and and many other states are considering it. Of course, this emotion of these shootings would uh, will just set us back a little bit. But and then when uh, when the when uh, the the government of the Ukraine was passing out a, uh, AKs, I think that really sealed the fate. And I thought, wait a minute, now I thought AK, uh, automatic weapons were horrible things, and you know these aren't semis; these are fully automatic. Uh, Bernie Sanders tweeted uh, that there's no need to have a, a you know a automatic weapon and a semi-automatic weapon. And I got back to him when they said to fight off your crazy uh, supporters. Of course, you need an AR, you know. And he, he didn't respond back for some strange reason. I'm still waiting for him to pay my medical bill. I'm still waiting for him yeah, to pay just, my just think, just think how different it would have been if Steve Scalise had an AK-47. That's right. Where, that's right. Uh, that uh, pr football practice or whatever it was. It was a baseball, yeah. So for the record, 
At Memorial Day weekend in Chicago, 46 shot and wounded, nine dead. Um, in the month of May, 247 people have been shot or wounded, 60 homicides, 57 of those with firearms. That's just in one month. That's a lot of people. And that's like every month in Chicago. It really is. I mean, some weekends are better than other others. If you uh, worse, I should say. If you go to HeyJackass.com, they've been keeping track of all of this data for years and years and years. And they have where you got shot, the location, whether there was, you know, uh, it, the data is just deep. And um, they've been following this, you know, Chicagoland for, for a very long time. So it's HeyJackass.com. It's a great resource. If anybody wants to talk to you about gun control, send them there and let them stare at those numbers. Um, we are currently in what they call the Summer of Joy. Every summer from Labor Day to Memorial Day, they have a special tracking of, because it gets hot, crime goes up, there's more shootings and more homicides. And it's every year. And like you said, they are gun control mechanisms. I think uh, a great stat, I think if you look at the United States, so a couple of two and a half million square miles, something like that, and if you looked at where most of the murders are committed, I would say to you, it's probably less than three or four hundred square miles of the whole country. If you look at D.C., New York, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, it's Baltimore, the, uh, Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore uh, Newark, New Jersey, and uh, you know some of these cities aren't that big square mile wise. So you would, you could probably, I'm sure, I wish, I don't know if it's been done, but you could probably make the case that the overwhelming majority of homicides. Uh, or I should say murders. We're not talking about suicide. Sometimes that number of suicides is added to the number of people killed by guns, and it's a suicide tragedy, but it's not done by a, a second or third party. Uh, I would say that uh, it's mostly in these, of course, these these cities where there's crimes out of control. But in most of the country, uh, people go along with their day, and they don't expect to be shot. And and the number of schools where they have school shootings is still infinitesimal. Yeah, we only Yeah, I think if um the I saw somebody pulled the data. If you take out like eleven, ten or eleven Democrat run urban areas, the United States turns out to be one of the safest places on the planet. They just all that's where all the crime is. You're absolutely right. Just think. We could uproot all of these cities and dump them in Rhode Island with room to spare. <laughs> And, that, and, that's and, and, close, and that's, no, that's not a great place to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Just Rhode Island. All the people would have to move their yachts because, you know, I mean, it's great boating, but with all that crime, you know, you need a new location. John Kerry would have to put his yachts I was, I was about else. to mention him, yes. Uh, <laughs> less taxes in Rhode Island for a Massachusetts uh, politician. Uh, all right, so we're running out of time. We were actually physically near the end of the program. I'm not sure how much you talked about Camp Constitution, Hell, I know registration is coming up, or it's already started. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how people can get connected with you yes, guys? Yes, well, our camp comes up July 17th to the 22nd. We do still have some room available. We've got over 100 registered, and so we do expect to fill up quickly. But we also have a weekend camp. Camp Sentinel in uh, Tuftonboro. That would be the September 30th to October 2nd. And you can get all this information from our website, campconstitution.net. And uh, we have a camp blog, and you can get a lot of details about our fly case. Uh, you know, there's so much we get. The, you can get the 49-page uh, uh, opinion uh, from the the unanimous opinion from the Supreme Court along with a lot of other uh, great resources. So campconstitution.net. And the Sam Blumenfeld archive. That's right. You can access them from the uh, homepage as well. All right. Well, um, I'm not exactly sure how my audio is going to sound, but you guys should sound great. Well, remember, it's recorded locally at High Fidelity and then uploaded. So. Well, that's exactly it, and that's why I said that, because one of the beautiful things about Riverside, and I always pimp this platform... There are a lot of other things we can do with it. We can have people um, off camera and just sitting and watching us live as we record it, whether it's live or not. There are all kinds of things we can do. We haven't even begun to broach, but this is a great platform for that very reason. It physically records the audio and the video locally. So no matter what happens to me, yours continues to get recorded, and it uploads it while you're recording it. So I will get... Your recordings will be fine, and I will have like four different recordings of me because I kept getting stuck for some reason. 
And uh, I will paste those all together and make a program, and it'll be great. And um, I want to thank you guys for just hanging in there and getting it done while I was all hung up. And Hal, uh, congratulations again on your Supreme Court thank win. You. You're thank the you. only person I actually know who I've met who won a case before the Supreme Court. So this is like an honor for me. And uh, Mike, of course, thank you. And Skip will be back uh, hopefully next week. So, gentlemen, have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Right. And everybody thank else. You. Have a great week. I hope Skip doesn't burn his slippers. That would probably... I hope he doesn't burn his slippers. No, we'll tell you about that later. So, everybody, <laughs> have a good night. Bye. We'll see ya. Rock Talk. <laughs>